Hello, everybody. It's Paul Carruthers, and I'm back for another edition of Off Track with Carruthers and Bice. I'm joined by my partner, Sean Bice, and our special guest today, Peter Hickman, who actually, I think, puts the man in Isle of Man TT, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, going through it, <laughs> go, look, looking, at, looking at your stuff today, um, it's pretty amazing. I mean, 13 Isle of Man TT victories, outright lap record at 136 and change, which... I just, I can't even comprehend, but, uh, and now we're going to do the Daytona 200. So that's what, obviously why we're talking to you. Um, and it's a good excuse to talk to you because I like the Isle of Man as well. So tell us a little bit about what made you decide you wanted to do Daytona. Well, first of all, thanks for the, uh, that's a rather awesome introduction. <laughs> thanks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, um, Daytona is something that I've wanted to do um, for quite a while, actually. It's been a big bucket list um, thing that I wanted to do, something I wanted to tick off. And uh, the opportunity finally came around. It's actually been pretty much three years in the making, this. It's uh, something I've tried to do in the last couple of years, and it's always uh, not quite happened for one reason or another. Uh, and then towards the end of last year, I managed to actually yeah, get everything, kind of dot all the I's, cross all the T's, and managed to, to get ourselves here. And, uh, I'm actually at Colin Edwards boot camp right now in Texas, just outside of Houston. Uh, so I got here yesterday, um, doing a bit of flat tracking, which I always do with Colin, um, the racer camp here in February, uh, which coincidentally coincides with, uh, with the Daytona 200 a week before. So ideal really for me, to be quite honest. So, um, hopefully I'll be at least somewhere near on the time zone ready for, for when we get to Daytona, but uh, I'm really looking forward to it. The, the 200 circuit looks unbelievable. Um, I say uh, it's something I've wanted to do for uh, for a long time now, and to finally get the chance to do it, uh, yeah, it's, it's absolutely brilliant. Not only that, I'm doing it with my own personal team, which is a little bit different as well, uh, and also with the support of Triumph and, and FHO, who I race for back in British Superbikes and the Isle of Man TT as well. Everyone's kind of got involved and got behind the project, which yeah, it's really really cool. I I might be going out on a limb here, but I have a feeling you're not going to have a hard time learning the track. <laughs> yeah i mean hopefully not i mean it's, i'm i'm somebody that tends to learn circuits pretty quickly anyway you must um, yeah but uh obviously there's not too many corners to to kind of take into consideration at daytona however you know for, for how simple the course is it's also quite intricate with knowing where to be on the circuit particularly on the banking it's where to be and how to be and getting your timing right is a, is a big part of it you know so i've been watching the last couple of years worth of uh, day 10 or 200, just to try and get a few tips. Uh, I've got a really experienced teammate in Richard Cooper, uh, who's riding for me as well. So uh, he's been to Daytona. He's finished fifth in the, in the Daytona 200 before. So uh, yeah, hopefully he can bring some some good experience to the team as well. We've got quite a few young lads actually in the team. So we've got a couple of 19, well, three 19-year-olds that are, uh, that are all part of the team as well as some other experienced guys. So it's, um, it's a real mix in, in the Hingman racing team, which is good. So, Peter, I want to ask you, of course, in the United States, the Daytona 200 is absolutely iconic for us, but so is the Isle of Man TT as well. And it's gotten more so with TV coverage, I think, as we kind of understand it more. And even fans in this country, when we say something about you racing in the 200, you know, people think, well, God, the guy's an Isle of Man person. So I want to ask you, what do you and your countrymen, I mean, think of the Daytona 200. You think about, you know, Barry Sheen raced in it um it's isn't it iconic for you guys as well absolutely it's yeah and uh, i think there has definitely been a, a bit of a downturn in the daytona 200 recently or in a few good few years ago but actually in recent years it's really ramping up again and uh you know the fact moto america is now involved with it and running the event i think it's just getting bigger and bigger and i think just look at the entry list this year i think 67 riders is it from 30 yeah. different countries so a really big international uh showing Quite a few Brits here, which is always brilliant. You know, it's actually going to be my first time I've ever raced in America. So that would be my first ever race in America. But hopefully we can get the Daytona 200 back to its um, glory days like it used to be. You know, I always kind of remember it with the Scott Russell days, right. um, which is something. Uh, yeah, it's just that's why I'm so excited to be here. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. I can't, uh, can't wait to get out on the bike. You know, the Daytona 200 has always been for us besides being iconic, it's always sort of a, an asterisk race. It's a different race. 
So much, you know, it used to be on the on the calendar for for uh, AMA and Moto America. We have it a little separate. I mean, we have it as a race, but it doesn't count in yeah. points towards Supersport. So we've always considered it this sort of separate thing. Your career has been really interesting in that you've done British Superbike and and World Superbike, but you've also done a lot of these things like the Alaman. You've done Macau GP. You've done. Uh, the Ulster GP. What what is it about these other kinds of races that that attract you so much? Yeah, it's a good question. Actually, to be quite honest, um, do, I, do you know what? I just like racing bikes. I don't really care where I race. I just like racing. I think when you can do something that's a little bit special, and I class Daytona 200 as being something special, it's like you said, it's a one-off. It's kind of a, it's something separate to everything else. I quite like events like that because i think you only get one shot a year at it it's not somewhere you can just come and test out or practice at you know it's same as the tt we get one shot a year you got them two weeks you got a week of practice week of racing and then that's it for another 50 weeks you go away again so any kind of racing like that I, I find really interesting and it's something that uh i always look forward to if i get that chance one thing in looking at you at your past especially with the isle of man it's like my dad raced there. He won twice, right? So he, I, I'm very familiar with the Isle of Man. But the fact that you did 129 miles an hour in your first season, because he's always told me, he's like, oh, it, it takes two years of racing as many classes as you can before you can even think about just, you know, you, you don't go necessarily 100%, but, you know, in that 90s range. How did you, how were you able to do that so quickly? Did you, did you spend a lot of time there before the race or not? Yeah, I spent quite a bit of time. Um, I, like I said earlier, I'm always somebody that picks up circuits really quite easily for some reason and not just circuits. Even if, uh, if I drove somewhere to like a friend's house for the first time, once I've driven it once, I kind of know it, which is quite interesting. I don't know why that is. Maybe I have a bit of a photographic brain or something. I don't know, but, um, I tend not to struggle to learn something. But with the TT, obviously, we're talking 260 plus corners, nearly 38 miles round. There's a lot to take in. So the year that I decided I was going to race, between the start of the year, so the 1st of January and the end of April, I went, uh, I don't know, seven times, I think, to the Isle of Man. Two days at a time, always two days at a time. I hired a car and just drove around and around. I did like five laps a day. It doesn't sound like a lot, but it takes an hour in a car to do one lap. So. Wow. We're talking five hours every day of just going round and round and round. And some people do it in sections, but for me, I always did it as a full lap. So I always think that that's how I'm going to ride it. So rather than doing a section, turning around and going back, I just did full laps all the time. And a lot of the time, I just had the radio on or had my music on. I was just driving normally. I wanted the, I wanted the circuit to feel like uh, the drive to work that I used to do every day. You know, when I left school and I went to work, I, I had probably a, a three or four mile run to work. Like even now, I never tried to learn that road, but I know it absolutely like the back of my hand because I used to drive it every day, and that's how I wanted the Isle of Man to feel to me. So that's why I did so many laps. So I did at least seventy laps wow. going round around the Isle of Man. It's seventy hours worth of driving around the place wow. before I ever rode it. On. Wow, that's crazy! You know, you and uh, you and Paul have something in common, um, Peter, because your dad raced in. Well, it was the Manx GP. I mean, it was the Isle of Man as well, like uh, like Kel did. So, um, by the way, so you guys both have that in common. By the way, is he yeah. big? Hi is he big hickey, and are you little hickey? Yeah, basically, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Although, okay. although actually, he's, he's a lot smaller than me now. I mean, I'm six foot two. So, oh. Um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, That's, so I'm more of the big hickey. I mean, he's more of the small hickey now. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, one of the things I want to ask you is, so on racetracks that are kind of, well, they're closed courses. I know the Isle of Man is as well, but I'm talking about a circuit. So, yeah. you know, for the most part, unless they change configuration, they'll repave it. They'll do some things. As time goes by, the motorcycles get faster. The tires get better. The riders, I don't know, more talented possibly. But the point is, uh, records keep going, keep going down. How in the heck does do you keep going faster on a on a street on a road, a street where I know that the surface? I'm, I assume they repave it sometimes, but there are some turns there. That I mean, what's what's how what's the fastest you can go, and what is the slowest you have to go? What are the two speeds? Um, 
Yeah, so just over the 200 miles an hour mark in a couple of places. Uh, last year, I actually recorded the fastest ever time down Sulby Strait, or the fastest ever speed trap down Sulby. I think I did 200, 202 mile an hour on the superbike at one point. Um, but Sulby actually isn't really the fastest place. There's a couple of other places that are faster. Um, so we are over the 200 mile an hour mark. The slowest actually, you know, would be Governor's Dip. Fifteen, twenty miles an hour at that one point. Wow. So this is where people. I mean, the one hundred and thirty-six mile an hour average is already massive. We all, I think, we all know that and understand that. However, to get that average, when you realise how slow some of the corners really are, you know, we're ninety-five percent of the lap. We're over one hundred and sixty miles an hour, like easily. And I know from start, which is twenty-four miles ish, something like that. The average is like one hundred. So from the start line to to over halfway through the course is over 150 mile an hour average. And again, even at that, there's some slow corners. So um, it's something I've never really looked at on the data, but it'd be really interesting just to see exactly what percentage we're over like 160 mile an hour. But I'm, for me, it's yeah, over 95% of the course is over 160 mile an hour. Now, do you do you still think there's, do you always go there thinking there's more to get? No, not really. I mean, something I get asked a lot is, oh, are you going to break the lap record again this year? Is this what you're going to do? To be honest, the lap record's really nice um, icing to have on the cake. It's it's kind of a, it's a nice little accolade to have. However, you know, lap records will always get broken. They don't ever last forever. The race win is what counts. And that's what we you know, I, I want to go and race. I want to race. I want to enjoy myself. That is priority number one and stay safe, of course. Um, but obviously winning the race is what really matters. Nobody can take that win away from you once you have it. So winning the race at the slowest possible pace is always the idea. Um, the lap record is, is just an added bonus if it happens. And usually it only really happens if the race is going that way that you need to push that a little bit more and, and beat your opponent. Now, a lot of people, a lot of people may not know, but obviously with the TT, it's not a group start like it is MotoGP or even Moto America. They start you off based on, I think, is it your finishing position from the year before in that race? It goes on, it technically goes on um, lap speed from your previous two years. So the top 20 riders are classed as seeded riders, and they're the top 20 fastest riders lap time-wise from the previous two years, usually. Um, And technically, we just start off in number order. So because I'm the fastest, I should start number one. However, that would also be a little bit boring for spectators. And also it means that they can't really teach anybody else. So I, like when I was, when I started out, when uh, in year two and year three, they actually bumped me up into the, into the top 20 so that I could learn off some of the faster riders. Does that make sense? So, mm-hmm. so in year two, I started number 17. So I had a couple of riders behind me that were maybe a little bit faster than me. And in year three, I was actually number five. So I had a lot of riders behind me that were really fast, but it meant that I could learn off them. Every time they passed me, I could learn something for a corner or two. And then that improved my ex- experience and, and my knowledge. Um, so they do try and mix it up a little bit. I always start usually number 10 now. Um, I don't like being number one on the road. It's a bit of a weird thing, but I just don't like setting off down that road first for some reason. Um, and number 10, I got given a while ago and it just seems to work for me. You know, the first time I ran number 10, I, I got five podiums out of five races, which were my first podiums at the TT, which is 2017. And from then, I've never really looked backwards. So um, it's just a number that seems to, I'm not superstitious, but it's a number that seems to have worked for me. So, um, yeah, we've ended up keeping it for now anyway. Well, my dad always said there was nothing better than like your rival being ahead of you and then you catch him on the track yeah. because, you know, yeah. he knows he knows he's beaten at that point, you know. Yeah, so feeling. yeah, so I I can I can understand that. Yeah, just want to live with that. Uh, and then try and keep uh, whoever they think will be the favourite. So at the minute, um, you would obviously class myself, Michael Dunlop, uh, probably Dean Harrison uh, as the favourites at the minute for for a lot of the races. So they try and keep us as far away from each other as possible. So Dean's was number two last year. Michael was number six. So there's a good 40 seconds between them. And then I was number 10, so there's 40 seconds between me and Michael as well. So they try and split who they think would be the favorites up as much as possible so that we're not, nobody's gaining an advantage. So Peter, since this is a public road, how much does the course change by year or over time? Do they, do they repave all of it? Do they repave sections? Like, 
I'm, and I'm talking about how, what they need to do for motorists as well as for you guys. I mean, how do they maintain it for kind of both, both purposes? Uh, a bit of everything. So yeah, usually there's always a bit of new tarmac somewhere uh, around the course, um, whether that be small fiction. Um, obviously they're doing a lot of normal road works maintenance like there would be. Uh, the good thing is that they work really well with the department who run the Isle of Man TT. So whenever the road team need to do something to the road, they'll consult um, with the race team and make sure that they're not doing something that's going to affect us as riders. Uh, and make sure they do it in a way that uh, that helps us as much of it, as much as anything. So even last year, there was actually quite a lot of new tarmac around the place. Some really big sections that had been um, resurfaced. Um, but yeah, every year I've been, the surface has always been, you know, they always, generally always make it better, which is <laughs> which is a good thing. Nothing seems to have got worse so far. I'm going to touch the woodness. But, uh, but yeah, everything so far has been, been really good. Well, I mean, do you guys guys have issues? Not so much much uh, Paul in California, but I live in the state of Ohio, and I mean, potholes are a thing. Isle of Man probably has some changeable weather. Are there ever any issues like potholes that they have to repair, and they must have to be really careful if they do it for that course? Yeah, they're, they're well on top of it for the actual TT course itself. They are super on top of that, so there's never any potholes or anything like that. Um, the surface is good; it's not necessarily smooth. There's a lot of bumps. You know, it is just a road at the end of the day, but they make sure they maintain it um, as to a higher standard or a higher standard than normal. If you go off the off the TT course onto maybe some of the other Manx roads, they're probably not anywhere near as good. And they have got all the potholes and all the rest of it, like the rest of the UK, to be honest. Um, but yeah, the actual race course itself, they uh, they keep well on top of. Okay, that's something I wanted to ask you. Sorry, Paul, I wanted to bring okay. this up. Whenever we go to Laguna Seca, I always say, have you ever been to Laguna Seca, Peter? Not yet. Okay. So whenever you go to Laguna Seca, the road that goes up to the course, the ra the racetrack, is really curvy, a little scary, but it's like better than a lot of roads I've ever been on. I, I've always thought it'd be cool to ride a motorcycle up and down there. So this kind of tells me that riding, driving a car as a, a regular, uh, not a pest, a motorist on this road is probably better than most roads you'd be on anyway because they use it for the, the race course. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, basically, yeah. Okay. And there's no restriction if you go there when the TT's not going on, you can you can just drive it like a normal person? Yeah. Um, <laughs> so even at the TT, there's no restriction. You can do the whole course. Um, the, the difference with the Isle of Man is anywhere that's outside of a village, the national speed limit is whatever you want it to be. So um there is no speed limits on the isle of man outside of villages so if you're going to a village yes it'll be 30 or maybe a 40 or something like that miles an hour but in between the villages and on the actual mountain section where there are no houses or anything there are no speed limits you can go <laughs> as fast as you want on any day that's just a normal thing and for the actual isle of man two weeks the whole festival the two weeks the mountain road course of so the bit that, that um joins ramsey and douglas they actually make it all one way for them two weeks as well. So you can't go backwards on the course at that point. So it literally is the same as what we do wow. race on. And what we ride on. You can go and ride it as a road rider or a car. There's buses, there's vans, there's, you know, there's people going on their daily commute to work. And then you've got people on bikes doing 190 mile an hour going past them. So oh, you, can pass the, you can pass the cops. You can do, yeah, it doesn't really matter. You know, you can go as fast as you want. Wow. Okay, back to Daytona. I'm I'm curious about this. Are you did you are you bringing a whole crew or are you yeah. using people that are already here? Or what, what kind of how, how many of you are traveling over here for this? Uh, quite a few. So uh, in total, in the team, there are twelve of us. So mm -hmm. two riders, ten staff. Um, I've also got uh, Faye Ho's coming over as well. So FHO, who I ride for in British Superbikes and also the Alaman TT. Um, she's sponsoring or helping sponsor this event for me as well, um, personally. So she's going to come over, uh, and I have a couple of friends already over here that uh, that are definitely also going to get involved. So um, yeah, we have quite a big crew for a two rider team. Um, it was interesting. As soon as soon as it all kind of got announced, I got a lot more friends that suddenly wanted to come. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that's always good. <laughs> it is good. So as far as um, the motorcycle goes, is this a motorcycle that you've raced that you race in the TT as well? 
Yeah, actually, the bike that I'm riding and the one that um, Richard Cooper's riding, we've uh, have both ridden around the Isle of Man TT, them bikes. Um, Richard doesn't do the Isle of Man TT. He does do the Northwest 200, so he's done some road racing. Um, but he's, he's not done the Isle of Man. But the actual bikes that we're on have both raced at the Isle of Man. So they're two 2022 spec Triumph Street Triple 765 RSs. Um, so it's the bike that I did uh, the 130 mile an hour lap on last year in the Super Sport race at the TT. Wow. Okay, so remind me again, and for people who don't know, the pit stops at the Isle of Man. I, I can't remember. Are they timed, so you have to uh, yeah. you have yeah. to spend a certain amount of time in the pit, right? So it's oh, not no, a, no, no. Oh, no, okay. No, no. no, it's as fast as you can do it. Okay, cool. Um, so is that fuel and tires? Uh, so in the Super Sport class, actually, we don't change wheels. Uh, we just put fuel in it. But the fuel's done very different at the TT. It's gravity fed like a normal pump, but look, there's no pump. It's just just a gun and gravity fed out of a tank. So the pit stops actually take uh, around 50 seconds to a minute, something like that. Um, whereas here at Daytona, obviously, we have quick fill dump tanks. Um, so I've actually had to get all my tanks modified, which uh, is something new for me as well. And I had to get a dump, proper dump tank and stuff so we can actually fill the tanks quick. Um, and obviously, we need to be changing front and rear wheel. So um we've had a load of parts made and we've done some some research and done our own stuff in fact i've even brought some parts out with me that we've not tested yet that we're going to have to at the start of the week because uh, everything was a bit last minute on a couple of things but um yeah it's something something going to be quite new for us changing wheels as fast as possible but uh yeah let's see uh let's see what we can do yeah and one of the things i want to say for the fans that want to keep track of peter hickman out there he's he's on a triumph speed triple rs but also it's a seven it's a 765 and his number is 765 right peter so we're going to know your displacement when you're riding around there yeah exactly that <laughs> so the, the the bikes that we're racing are part of the new generation class um so the new generation of super sport bikes so yes the, it's oversized cc but then it's been restricted to engine spec and also the electronics hold back um the bike from from its full potential so um, the whole idea is no matter what bike you're on um, everything's equivalent, equivalent to uh, a top flight 600 cc proper super sport engine. yeah and the balancing we've had has been pretty good i mean last year was great considering that 955 and you know there was uh you know 636 and you know 750 suzuki and obviously the triumphs too so it's been pretty good i assume it's going to be balanced pretty well this year one one of the things i want to ask you so you you've never done the daytona 200 have you ever been to daytona international speedway not at okay. all, no. It's, it's going to be completely oh. new. So, uh, okay. yeah, I can't wait to see the banking. Right. I want to tell That's you cool. something. I want you to promise me you do this. Not only when you come in through the tunnel and just see that amazing banking, because you've done some crazy things in your time, but you've obviously never ridden on banking like that. You got to go over when you get a chance and walk up from the bottom apron of that track to the top. It's like climbing a stairs with no steps in it. I mean, you can do it. It's not hard. You're bet you're in better shape than me, so you could do it. But my point is, <laughs> it's actually, you get a sense of how steep it is just by, by doing that. And that's going to be quite an experience for you, I'm sure. Yeah, absolutely. That um, my my dad actually has been here. He's he didn't race, but he was here uh, in the eighties, um, and he said exactly the same thing to me. He's like, "You're not going to believe just how steep the the banking actually is." And he said the same thing. He was like, "You need to go and try and walk up it because it's, it's just <laughs> yeah. unreal." <laughs> now, now looking at you and your teammate, it's like big and yeah. not so big, right? Yeah. Big and big and definitely not big. Yeah, there you go. Um, <laughs> so, it, I mean, there's obviously not too many setup things that you guys can copy. Uh, not so much, but I mean, Rich has already ridden the bike for me uh, in a few places. So uh, he did a wild card last year in the British Super Sport Championship at Cadwell Park on the on the same bike. Um, we did like one day track day test before the event, and then he went straight into it, pretty much in the deep and really just past the midpoint in the Super Sport season. And uh, managed to to get a second place podium uh, in wow. the second race of the weekend. So um, so he actually knows the bike quite well already, and he does quite a lot of testing for Triumph. That's actually his job. He does uh, he does bike testing. So um, so he, he understands the bike really well. And we have been out in Spain testing a little bit as well, slightly different spec actually to what we're going to be ra racing at Daytona. But um, yeah, he knows the bike really well inside out. So uh, and we're going to look at trying work work together as a team as much as possible i mean like you say obviously i'm i'm six foot two richard's uh i don't know 
four foot ten or something in the room actually. That's why. <laughs> oh, he's there. Yeah, how tall are you, Richard? Oh, he's five five. I reckon he's five five with heels wow. on anyway. So. I, and I can say I can say this because I'm also small, but you could have asked him how short he is. <laughs> nah, he could have done that. Actually, I was much actually, more polite than that. You see, Paul. <laughs> it's uh, I, I've got to I've got to admit, actually, I um. After I wrote the press release that you guys sent in and I headlined it, you know, TT winner coming, blah, blah, blah. And somebody got hold of me and said, hey, you're missing the boat here with this Cooper guy because he's got a really good chance of winning that motorcycle race. And 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 honestly, I didn't know at that point, but he's somebody that definitely we have to keep our eye on. Oh, 100 percent. Yeah. I mean, just to have a look back at his career and what he's ridden and what he's won. Two time British Superstock champion. Is that right? So, yeah, two-time 1,000cc Superstock champion in, in Britain. Numerous race wins, including British Superbike race wins as well. Um, won at the Northwest 200. Yeah, he's been he's been here, there, and everywhere. He's been riding a lot longer than me. He's, he's way older than I am. <laughs> I, 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 I've got a silly question for you, but I know you. I know the room you're in right now at Colin's place. Does he still yeah. have the, the small door and it says, like, Pedrosa's entrance or something? Yeah, yeah, we'll change it to Cooper's entrance. Okay. Week. <laughs> that's, that's, <laughs> what, that's what I was going to suggest. <laughs> oh, that's terrible. That's terrible. Hey, Richard, I want to ask you, or Peter, I'm sorry, Richard's not on here. Coop, Coops is off to the side. Sorry, I got hung up. Um, so, Peter, I want to ask you, the other thing you've competed in is the Cow GP, which is an also, also another crazy race. The thing I can't get over, and I've never been there, and I don't even know if I watched it all on TV, but there's that one section where you guys kind of skim your shoulder on that that Armco guardrail. Do you do you touch yeah. the Armco? Are you doing that going through there? I try not to. Yeah, um, it's a, <laughs> yeah. Quite a few riders do. Um, it's a really particular. There's one particular spot where it happens a fair bit. Um, you can actually do it pretty much the whole way around the course if you really want to. But um, there's that one particular corner, just the way the layout of the circuit is, lends itself to it. And a lot of riders have, uh, have obviously to brush the wall there and the camera people always know so the photographers are always in the right spot to try and get it. Um, <laughs> I've never, I've never, I think maybe I've touched it once or twice, maybe, but yeah, that's about it for me. I try and, um, <laughs> try and avoid the walls to be quite honest in the gal. Yeah. Yeah. Well, when you touch it, does it grab you or does it slide? Okay. Do you feel yeah, it? When you can, yeah, you can feel it, but it, you're only just kind of skimming it, but you're going that fast. Obviously, if you dug it in really hard, then yeah, maybe it would pull you back a little bit. But um, but now nah, normally you just get a little skim across it. Okay. And then the other thing I want to ask you is, it, I, I would only ask you this during the off season, and I haven't really asked many riders this, but since you've done so many different kinds of racing and, and are going to be coming to Daytona, when you're, let's just talk about the Isle of Man when you're out there. There's a lot, you're out there a lot of time, but I know you're you're committed the whole time. So there's not a lot of time to think. But do you have a realization of your own mortality when you're out there? Do you think I'm doing a pretty damn dangerous thing right now? Or do you just put it out of your mind completely? I think uh, I think it's out of your mind completely. I, I've, I've explained it to other people in the past before as um, all of us riders know what we're getting into. You know, we're not um, as much as we might be idiots. We're not idiots, if that makes sense. Yeah, um, yeah. You're really you know, smart <laughs> idiots. <laughs> Yeah, really. Yes, yeah, smart idiots. Yeah, exactly. Um, I think we've all accepted what could happen before we set off. So because we've already accepted it, it's something that we don't need to think about. Um, I don't know if that that makes complete sense, but it kind of does to me. I think because we've already, uh, yeah, we've just accepted that risk. So if we're okay with that acceptance, then then it doesn't even enter your brain again. Yeah, I mean, it seems like that's a road racer's mentality, even for riders that race in closed courses or tracks. And I didn't, just wasn't sure. I mean, I figured that would be the case for you. You'd have to do it. But just you're, you're involved in so many variable environments with what you're doing. Um, and speaking of that, like with the Isle of Man, I, I imagine that they do a pretty good job of understanding about the weather. But have you ever been on the course and like it's perfectly fine in one section and all of a sudden it's raining like crazy in another section or something else is going on? Uh, a little bit, not, not so much. I mean, we don't ride in the rain anymore at the Isle of Man TT, um, mainly to, for, uh, for the safety reason, to be quite honest, because it can be like the half of the course will be wet and half of it will be dry. Um, dry tires obviously don't work in the rain. So you're looking at super dangerous, um, super dangerous thing to do if you're riding on slicks in the, on a wet part of the circuit and then vice versa, if you put wets on, 
in the dry parts of the circuit, it's so, the bikes are so fast that the, the wets just wouldn't hold up. So um, since about 2011, 2012, they no longer race in the rain at the Alaban TT. I've been in races, however, that halfway through the race, there's been some sections where there's been a bit of water um, coming down, and then generally the, the, the race actually gets red flagged. If it gets too much, then the, if it actually starts to change the surface of the of the course over a um, a bigger section, then they will, they will 100% uh, red flag the race. Well, you know, you think about the United Kingdom in general and how it has sort of this reputation for – Raining. I mean, rainy weather. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they kind of feel that way with uh, where I live too. cloudy and a lot of rain. But um, do they have do they is it will they only if there's any chance of rain, do they go at all? I mean, because sometimes it can rain when there's, you're not even expecting it. So, yeah, um, generally, I mean, they, they keep on top of it. Uh, obviously, you can never fully predict the weather. But I mean, if they think there's going to be a really good chance it's going to rain, then yeah, they'll hold off and maybe just wait a little bit, or they'll do the opposite. They'll try and bring it forward if they have to, and try and get the race done a slightly earlier, or or whatever they think is the is the right call, or they'll reduce the race by a lap if they think that that's what they need to do to make sure the race actually finishes. Um, the the Ironman organization, the ACU, have done a really good job with that. You know, since I've been going 2014, so this is yeah, ten years for me now. Although I've not obviously missed a couple of years because of uh, the pandemic and stuff, um, they've been super, super on it with uh, with communication to all the teams, with riders and spectators, and all all the rest of it. So and and so far they've been bang on with every decision that they've ever made when it's come down to weather. All right, Sean, you got much else? Yeah, I want to ask one question about last He's year. He's always Peter. got more. I, I do. I got more, way more. But I'll, <laughs> listen. Listen, Hickey, I'll ask you and Coop, Coop some questions when I get there. So, but um, I want to ask yeah, you this. Yeah, no worries. <laughs> I want to ask you this. I'm I quite I'm quite fond of Moto America's um, Twins Cup Championship. I really like those middleweight twin cylinder bikes. And it, last year, you raced in a Super Twins class on a Yamaha. Was it an R7? Yes, that's right. Yeah. Okay, and you went pretty fast on that thing. Do you how do you, how do you like riding twins bikes? Uh, yeah, it's quite, actually quite difficult for me. Again, I'm one of the bigger riders, yeah. so yeah, you know, power, power to make, to weight makes a massive difference. Um, you know, and I'm like even against Coops, I think I'm nearly not far off thirty kilos heavier than he is. So it's like you're talking probably about fifteen horsepower when you look at it that way, particularly on the small bike. So um, the actual R7 worked really well. It was brand new when I took it to the Northwest. I'd never even sat on it before when I went to the Northwest on it. We had pretty much a standard engine when we went there as well. And then by the time we got to the TT, we had a, a tuned engine. We had loads of problems with it, with a, an electronic issue, which actually nothing to do with us. But anyway, it was just one of them things. We eventually found it um, and managed to race it and finished fourth in the first race on it. I actually only did one complete lap before the race. so And that was the morning of that race. We managed to finally get a lap on it. Um, without any problems and the, the organizers normally have to do two laps to qualify a bike um, but obviously with my experience background and the fact i did a, a a pretty fast lap even though it was only one lap it was already fast enough uh, they gave us some dispensation to actually start the race and i ended, I ended up fourth in the first race um, which was a little bit of a surprise to be quite honest we were not expecting it the handling of the r7 is actually really really good it just we were, had lack of development really on on engines and speed and the bike was already uh it was nine kilos over the weight the bike was so oh, not wow. only am i heavy but the bike was actually really heavy as well wow. so yeah we were we were at quite a disadvantage to be quite honest um and then in the second race um it was a it was a real war of attrition and the three bikes that managed to beat me in the first race all broke down either on lap one or lap two and uh, i ended up winning the race on uh, on the final lap and uh yeah, brought brought it back home in the P one position, which was uh, yeah, it was really really cool. That's great. All right, one more for me, Paul. Um, so I, I wanted to mention. So in this two hundred, obviously your size is uh, you're going to be joined by six four Corey Alexander. I think Jake Lewis is about that tall, and Hayden Gillum's a big boy too. So you guys are all going to be trying to crawl under that paint going around that banking. <laughs> but um, I want to ask you one other question. This is kind of off the cuff a little bit. So you've raced leader bikes a lot for on a lot of different courses. And now we have this super sport next generation. I want to ask you what your thoughts are about the future, because we're hearing some things about, we've heard possibly the R1 isn't going to be around after a couple of years. I wonder if 
now if leader bikes are going to go by the wayside, I mean, there was a time when a super bike was a 750 or though thereabouts. Do you think that the super sport next generation bikes will become our, we will become super bikes and we won't have thousand CC bikes anymore? I mean, I don't, I don't really know the answer to that question, to be quite honest. I guess it's going to be down to the manufacturers at the end of the day, isn't it? It's, yes. uh, well, it's down to the manufacturers, but it's only really down to the manufacturers because of consumers. If consumers are still buying the bikes, they'll keep making them. If mm-hmm. The less that, they, that people buy big 1,000cc sports bikes, then the less likely they are to get made. Um, obviously, there's been a downturn a lot of the time in that, but I know from a BMW point of view, because obviously I'm also a BMW rider, or primarily yes. a BMW rider, really, um, you know, they sell a lot of thousand CC super bikes. So I think for them at this current moment, you know, they don't have necessarily a plan to, to stop making thousand CC bikes because they're selling so much. So I guess really it's always going to be down to, to the, ma- the manufacturers of what happens with it. With the new generation coming through where you've got this big mix of all sorts of different classes of bike almost racing in the same race on a balanced rule, I can see how that could be quite appealing and, and particularly could end up being the way forward in future depending on what happens with all the manufacturers yeah yeah i mean you're, you're definitely right of course at bmw also that panigale v4r um seems to be selling pretty well too so that makes sense i don't think that the the we can ring the death knell yet for uh leader bikes but and, and plus i think oh, it's yeah. safe to say it almost doesn't matter to you right because hickey you will r- race anything won't you <laughs> <laughs> yeah, whatever gets put in, I'll race it. But um, I must admit, I am a I am a fan of the big bike. You know, I love thousand cc bikes. Um, I, I know there was a rumor a while ago that um, the two hundred was going to go back to super bikes, and that oh. uh, that that um, that definitely excited me a bit as well. But um, I've not heard anything on that. Rec- I've not heard anything on that in in more recent times. But I know a few years ago there was there was definitely a rumor about it uh, becoming a thousand cc race again. But um, yeah, they have to be. Sh- It'd have to be shortened a bit. Yeah. The other thing with it too, as much as we like, you know, we all love super bikes, but if it wasn't for the, the class and the structure we have now, there's no way there'd be 67 of them at Daytona, you know? Yeah. 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 They're expensive and, to run the, the, Yeah. To, to run them properly, they're expensive. Yeah. Okay. We're going to cut you I'm loose good. and go back to no the, mis- <laughs> go back to flat track and, and, and be safe because it's probably more dangerous than Daytona. <laughs> it probably is yeah no i'm gonna be uh, i'm gonna be looking after myself this week we're gonna have some real good fun here and that's then, great uh, yeah they turn right. on sunday so can't wait and and say hello to the boys yeah. down there calling in those guys uh yeah say hi for us i've, I've been to that camp okay. one time but it's been a few years so have fun <laughs> cool place thanks guys all right see ya yeah